Hello, everyone. Welcome to Conservation and Management of Amphibians and Reptiles of the Southwestern United States. This is the final in a five-part series of webinars. My name is Jen Williams. I'm the National Federal Coordinator for Partners in Amphibian and Reptile Conservation. Um, I have Sarah Sparhawk with me. She is the Visual Information Specialist for the National Park Service, and she's assisting with the logistics of the webinar. So I just wanted to extend a special thank you to Sarah. Um, I'm going to go over some logistical items before we start the webinar. If you're interested in asking questions, please type them into the questions box on your control panel. So again, you want to use the questions box and not the chat box. Um, the reason we um, have you enter the information into the questions box is that we can export um, everything that was entered into there um, after the webinar and it will then contain all the questions asked as well as the contact information of um, whoever asked the questions. And then having this information for the future will help us to better tailor content for future webinars. If questions keep coming up, we'll know that we need to hit that particular um, topic better. So we are recording today. This webinar will be posted on the PARC website at parkplace.org. That's P-A-R-C place.org. And if you click Habitat at the top of the page and then select Webinar, you will find the page where the recording will be housed. And um, you will see recordings from past webinars in this series as well. So a little bit about the speakers. Larry Jones is a retired biologist who spent over 40 years working for federal, state, and local natural resource agencies. Ken Halama serves as director of the Mott Rim Rock Reserve and Emerson Oaks Reserve for the University of California Natural Reserve System at UC Riverside. Rob Lovich is a senior natural resource specialist for the US Navy in San Diego, California, and Rob manages projects throughout the Southwest. More information about their degrees and other expertise can be found in the webinar announcement. And so just a reminder to the speakers to be on mute unless it's your turn to talk. Um, and so we'll start off with Larry and take it away, Larry. Okay, thanks, Jen. Uh, next slide. Okay, so what we're going to talk about today uh, about this webinar. So some of you may not know what PARC actually is. It's Partners in Amphibian and Reptile Conservation. And then in particular, I want to talk a little bit about the Southwest region. Then after that, Ken is going to get into uh, some basic information on reptiles and amphibian natural history because, let's face it, uh, people don't tend to know as much about reptiles and amphibians as they do birds and mammals, even if they're biologists. So we're trying to uh, give people a little jump start there. Also, we want to give them a jump start on our Southwest Habitat Management Guidelines. This is the main reason we're meeting today. And what we're trying to do is focus on some of the animals and their habitats and how to manage them when we're trying to manage for uh, many other different taxes. And also uh, hopefully give some people ideas for management options of what to do. And so really we're trying to help you get started using that Southwest HMG and I hope everybody has one. If not, I'm sure you can uh, contact Jen or go onto the park website to find out. Next slide. So we'd, the committee here would like to thank the U.S. Forest Service for, for some financial uh, aid in doing this. And on my final year or so of the Forest Service, when I was working for the Forest Service, uh, they actually funded me to work on the Southwest Habitat Management Guide so we could get it wrapped up. Thanks. Next. Okay, as I mentioned, um, even biologists are more familiar with birds and mammals than probably fishes than they are a number of uh, amphibians and reptiles. And unfortunately, what this means is a lot of people are kind of unaware of amphibians and reptiles and what their ecological roles are, uh, how important they are. And uh, when I talk about my slides, these photographs, I'll tell you what they are. Um, this one in the upper left is beautiful little snake. It's called a Sonoran shovelnose snake. It looks a lot like a Sonoran cruel snake, but this is a essentially a non-venomous animal. And a lot of amphibians and reptiles, especially snakes, are often maligned. And um, I came upon this western diamondback rattlesnake when I was looking for snakes one night that had its head smashed and its rattles cut off. 
And whoever did this probably thought they're doing society a favor by getting rid of this. But make no mistake, these things have important ecological roles. And this snake probably wouldn't be in a lot of rodents uh, in its lifetime. So hopefully you'll have a little awe and wonder about these animals when we're done here. Next. So what is PARC? It stands for Partners in Amphibian and Reptile Conservation. And really it's, it's nothing you have to be a member of. It's an umbrella organization uh, that if you want to be part of it, all you have to do is come to an annual meeting or look at the website or work with others, uh, your other partners. And so it's a very diverse group. And when we have our annual meetings, um, you know, once a year, we have them in a different state. Uh, you'll see that there are federal agencies involved, such as the Forest Service, APHIS, BLM, National Park Service, Fish and Wildlife Service. And there's always good representation from state wildlife agencies. So we tend to have all herpetologists from all of our states, or at least most of the states, at these annual meetings. But there are others that are involved, such as non-government organizations, academia, uh, lots of universities, um, even high schools zoos, professional societies, environmental consultants are really big now. There's a, a lot of people, biologists make their living uh, with environmental consultants and there's lots to do. And then there's just plain old individuals who are managers of uh, the landscapes themselves and they can all be part of park. Next. So the way park is organized, it's essentially United States and uh, Northwestern Canada uh, have park regions. And there's two ways to look at these park regions. One is by the member states. I say member because these borders are drawn around the state lines. And then there are also biogeographic boundaries. Um, so if you look at this, you'll see there's five park regions. There are a number of state chapters. And in the Southwest, that's a big yellow blob there you can see. Uh, a very large area, and that includes the states of Arizona, California, Colorado, Nevada, New Mexico, Oklahoma, Texas, and Utah. But if you look at that yellow blob, you also see that to the north, if you're, say, in Northern California, uh, you actually have an environment that is more like the Northwest than you do like the Southwest. And the same with Texas, if you look to Eastern Texas, it's much more ecologically aligned with the Southeast uh, Park region. So you need to consider both of these when you're reading the HMG. Next. So Park's mission is pretty much what its name is. <laughs> it's forging, forging proactive partnerships to conserve amphibians, reptiles, and the places they live. So it's about conserving amphibians and reptiles and their habitats. And one of the ways that the park does this um, is through publications. So uh, I'll get into some of the publications we have in a little bit. This next slide, I mean, sorry, the next thing, the training, the slide shows a training program that was done for the flat-tailed horn lizard. This is sponsored by PARC. And then we also have our annual meetings. I mentioned those. Uh, this year, it's going to be in Oklahoma. And then we have annual reports that's done at the national level. Then we have websites. All of the uh, the national and regional and state chapters all have their own websites. Just Google those to find those. We also have a few webinars, and you can even have projects where you get partners together to work on various things, such as a wetland project. Next. So talking about some of the um, publications, I think one of the most powerful things we can do is uh, give something to our end users to look at to help them know how to manage their amphibians and reptiles, how to conserve them. So on the left, you'll see the Inventory and Monitoring Handbook. It's been out a couple of years. I don't actually know its availability. Um, and admittedly, this is a little lean on the southwestern area, mostly because a lot of the uh, people who wrote this were in the east, but you know, it's still one of many tools that can be used. So what we've done is we have a Southwest uh, region 
habitat management guidelines. We call that the HMG. So you can see on the right, that's the HMG that we have with the Gila monster on the front. And in the middle, we talk about regional priority species and parkas. So this Southwest Park came up with a list of uh, reptiles and amphibians, and sometimes groups of those that we are concerned about as far as their conservation. And parkas, if you're familiar with the important bird areas, this is just the amphibian and reptile counterpart. And th this is, the parkas are in the works, but the regional priority species are actually in the pan E of the habitat management guideline. Next. So there are five regions in park, and each one has its own habitat management guidelines, or the HMGs. And you can see the one on the right, it's enlarged, bigger than the other one, but that's because it's better. That's because we put it together. So actually, it is it is physically larger, uh, not length and width, but depth, because it has more pages because there are quite a few more entries in the Southwest. And you'll see why that is in a minute. But also notice that the other HMGs all have amphibians on the front. And the Southwest region was the first one to put the um, put a reptile on the front. And that's um, partly because the Southwest is really known for its reptiles, over so the uh, most other regions, although there are a lot in the southeast also. Next slide. So talking about the diversity of amphibians and reptiles across the different regions, you can see uh, the southwest on the far left and going over to the northwest region. So those are the five regions. The blue bar is the total number of amphibians and reptiles in the region as uh, indicated by state boundaries. And then reptiles in the red, so you can see there's a lot more reptiles in the Southwest than there are elsewhere in the other regions. And amphibians, we actually have more species of amphibians in the Southwest than we do in other regions. A part of this is an artifact of the fact that all of Texas is included as a Southwest state because the southeast also has many species of amphibians, and the eastern United States in general. The actual total number, this is an older slide, so the actual total number that we have in the HMG is 436 total amphibian reptiles in the southwest. Next. So this is just showing you uh, how we stack up. Um, with other regions, and you wouldn't expect many frogs and toads in a place that's as arid as um, the arid southwest, but there are actually 76 species, which is really surprisingly high. We're not the highest, but it's quite high. Uh, for example, we have a lot of frogs and toads that are explosive breeders that come when the monsoon arrives. Um, the salamanders, this is kind of surprising also, we have about as many as the Southeast, which has the most species. And it's mostly because California and Texas each have a lot of species of salamanders. Turtles, we lose out to the Eastern United States, although there are many in, uh, also many in Texas. And Texas is a big state, so we have a lot of animals there. The lizards, uh, th this region is by far the best region for lizards. We have 111 species, which is over 90% of all of the species down in the U.S., so most of them are here. Snakes, we have even more species of snakes, which is more than any other region, 127 species. And we even have one crocodilian, again, in East Texas and Oklahoma. And that's not many, but it's 50% of all species in the United States. So that comes out with 436. Again, it's the most diverse region based on the those counts in one of the matrices and one of the appendix in the uh, Southwest HMG. Next. So, this, there's a diversity of habitats. This really starts the explanation of why we have so many species. So, I'm going to go through these pictures uh, going from the upper left going clockwise, and then I'll end up in the middle, just so you know what these are showing. 
So we have desert habitats such as White Sands National Monument, the upper left. To the right, uh, we have plains grasslands and wetlands. This is in Colorado, I believe. Uh, then we also have high mountains. The Sierras and the um, Rocky Mountains are very high, and there's actually animals living up there, timberline in some of these places. Uh, some very sensitive, sensitive animals up at these elevations. We have lots of forests and woodlands. It's not all desert out here. And if you think of California to Texas, we have um, ocean front on um, both California and in the Gulf of Mexico. And there are animals that live at this interface as well. So there's diversity of habitats. Next. Means that we have a diversity of species. And this just shows a snapshot of the 436 species. And the upper left, that's a Gilbert skink. It's a breeding male, very beautiful animal. Um, Right of that is the Sonoran Desert Toad. This is a toad that's almost as big as your head. <laughs> and uh, below that is the yellow mud turtle. It's one of the actual southwest turtles we have. Far lower left, that's a Mojave rattlesnake. You may know that because of its notoriously venomous nature. And in the center, uh, one of the many types of salamanders you have in Texas and Oklahoma are some of these. Uh, troglodytes that live uh, in caves and they're blind and have gills throughout their body. So this is these blind cave salamanders, really interesting animals. Next. And so you have all these species and all these different habitats and now you have to figure out how to manage for all these things. So that's where it's really a challenge and that's where the Southwest HMG comes in. So just an example of some of these uh, management options and challenges. Again, starting upper left, uh, prescribed burns. Uh, most of our ecosystems here are fire adapted. This is a grassland that's uh, being managed with fire. To the upper right, you'll see this is uh, somebody, biologist swabbing for chytridiomycosis, a, a devastating disease of amphibians in the Southwest and beyond. Cattle grazing is one of the biggest uses of public lands and uh, private lands in the Southwest. And then the lower left shows the uh, one part of the existing border fence along the border of Mexico. So this is something that's exclusive in the Southwest of having this border with Mexico and uh, issues that go along with that. In the center, we have lots of open spaces in the West. And the southwest, and this is good areas for wind and solar energy, but we also have uh, coal mining, uranium mining, and, and other uses such as that. So lots of challenges. Next. Now I'll hand it over to Ken. Okay, thanks, Larry. <clears throat> uh, what we'd like to go over in the next uh, series, series of slides is a little bit about the natural history of the uh, reptiles and amphibians and some of the, the aspects of their biology that you need to consider uh, when you're developing some sort of management plan. And of course, uh, the animals that we're uh, focusing on today are uh, amphibians and reptiles known collectively as herps. And they are two distinct classes of vertebrates that have very different characteristics from one another. And amphibians, um, most of them have a two-stage life cycle, an aquatic phase and a terrestrial phase. They have moist skin uh, that's water permeable, and many species uh, don't have any lungs, so the skin is actually their only uh, breathing organ. It acts like a large respiratory surface, like the inside of a lung. And for their reproduction, they require a moist area to lay eggs and for the eggs to develop. On the other hand, on uh, the left hand or right hand side of the slide here, reptiles don't have a two stage life cycle. Usually, when they hatch out of the egg, they resemble the adults and then grow accordingly. Uh, their skin is dry and impermeable, and that allows them to exploit uh, many different habitat types that amphibians can't. 
and reproductive wise they aren't tied to moist areas the way that amphibians are uh, reptiles lay a cladoic egg that allows for gas exchange and very limited water exchange and again that uh, helps them to exploit a number of different habitat types uh, next slide please so um uh of course, amphibians and reptiles, different species, have different natural history characteristics, and uh, it's going to vary greatly between different species. And uh, if you're managing for, um, say, a frog or different species of frogs, um, you have to take con into consideration the natural history characteristics of the individual uh, species. But there are five major factors that uh, you should consider um, when catering to the management and pr preservation of uh, amphibians and reptiles, and at least keep them in the back of your mind um, uh, when you're addressing different management questions. Uh, next slide. Uh, the first thing, uh, unlike birds and mammals, uh, reptiles and amphibians are ectothermic. Birds and mammals uh, have a high internal metabolism and it generates uh, body heat that they have to maintain in order to keep their uh, process, the body processes, processes going. Amphibian reptiles have a very slow metabolism and they have to rely upon the temperature of the external environment in order to get their uh, body temperature up to uh, a range where they can feed and mate, etc. And um, uh, so they're termed ectothermic or cold-blooded. So being ectothermic uh, has its advantages because during uh, periods of drought or cold or excessive heat, uh, um, reptiles and amphibians can essentially shut down and reduce their uh, energy load and just wait these periods out. Next slide, please. And another aspect of uh, uh, herps is that you don't really see them uh, out and about very much. They're mostly hidden and solitary. Um, amphibians, uh, it's really understandable because they are uh, tied to moisture envi environments. Um, so you find them underwater in ponds and uh, aquatic environments, uh, under rocks, maybe in caves. And uh, but when they do venture forth, it's usually after rainstorms uh, at night when the air is moist and there's a lot of water on the ground and they can actually be quite conspicuous on roads uh, um, if you go driving around at night to look for them. Um, reptiles, uh, even though they are solitary and they tend to venture forth during the day, but many species are cryptic and can disappear against uh, a background. And um, most snakes and lizards are that way. Some of the diurnal lizards actually are conspicuous. You can see them sitting on the tops of rocks if you go looking for them. And usually during the breeding season, amphibians will collect in large groups around ponds to breed. Um, and for many snake species, they'll gather at hibernacula before they go down uh, for uh, winter estivation or hibernation. And they can be found in lar large numbers then. Next slide, please. And uh, reptiles and amphibians uh, use a variety of habitats, both aquatic and terrestrial throughout their lives. Amphibians, of course, use aquatic habitat when they're uh, larval and then move on to the uh, terrestrial habitats as, as adults. And uh, even uh, within uh, um, a few days, uh, they can use various different habitats. Uh, royal toads, which are an endangered species here in uh, Southern California, um generally burrow and spend the diurnal hours uh, burrowed into the sand along streams and when they breed they're usually found along streams too but uh, in the evenings uh, when they go out to forage they can venture far away from the streams uh, sometimes up to a quarter mile away from uh, the nearest water source uh, to, to, to forage and then they return to the uh, streams to estivate or to burrow under the ground again. Um, and uh, snakes, uh, especially during the breeding season, male snakes will cruise around looking for females and pass through many different habitat types during that time. Next slide, please. And um, both amphibians and reptiles 
have widely fl fluctuating, uh, fluctuating populations that change, tend to change uh, according to uh, climatic conditions. Uh, now, most herps are secondary consumers and they rely on insects and rodent prey. And then the insects and the rodent prey, of course, many of them are primary consumers and rely on primary productivity. And during very wet years, you get a lot of plant growth, uh, rodents and insects feed on these. They reproduce, produce a lot of offspring, and then uh, the herps feed on these um, uh, prey, and then the herp um, populations increase. And this is data that was uh, collected by our very own uh, Larry Jones that just shows you the correlation between uh, the um, moisture and the population population size of uh, reptiles. These are, I think these are lizard, yeah, lizards in the southeastern United States. And another thing uh, about herps in general is that, like many other species, they tend to have metapopulation, a metapopulation structure, so that even though a population may go extinct in one area, uh, migration or immigration, emigration from other areas can replenish a population. So you may have local populations raising, rising and crashing, but um, throughout the whole metapopulation structure, the numbers may uh, maintain, may stay relatively stable over time. Uh, next slide, please. And uh, really important that amphibians and reptiles are part of a functioning ecosystem. They serve as prey and serve as predators and important in the flow of energy from lower trophic levels up to higher trophic levels. And um, for humans, um, herps play or provide certain ecosystem services, such as biological control, uh, rodent control, insect control, sea dispersal in some cases, and uh, cultural. Uh, many um, Native American uh, Native American tribes uh, uh, utilize um, uh, the cultural aspects of uh, herps in, in religious ceremonies. Okay. And also crocodiles and alligators and some of the larger species can actually be keystone species and uh, help to create a diverse, uh, diverse and functioning ecosystem. Next slide, please. And with thanks, that, Larry. I'll turn it over to, to Rob. Yeah, thanks, Larry and Ken. Um, so that gets us to kind of the meat of the matter as far as what is the content, what's in the Southwest HMG. Uh, as Larry mentioned, there were some challenges because of the, the size and the diversity of habitats within a region as big as the Southwest. And so we do have a lot of color photos. We labored hard to make sure that it was loaded with good photo content to help display what is found in the Southwest and those habitats and herps, conservation challenges. Um, there are both general and habitat specific recommendations for management. And just like the other HMGs uh, on that point, I want to uh, reinforce that uh, these were written in a manner both to manage for biodiversity exclusively and to manage for uh, other land uses. So where you have to juggle um, herps and, and the biodiversity with other potentially conflicting land uses. So the HMG realizes that uh, everyone's not out there trying to maximize herps on their landscape. And so it's written in a way that you can find something applicable to your land area and the way that you manage it. Uh, there's also a, a lot of sidebars and uh, unique stories that we put in, uh, success stories, safety, adaptive management, et cetera. And then the appendices, um, priority species, the management planning, and other helpful resources load up the back end of the document. Next slide. Um, these measures, guidelines in the, in the HMG are uh, all there to promote conservation of amphibians and reptiles. We want a, a mantra for park has always kind of been keeping common species common. Today's common species could be very much imperiled tomorrow, depending on uh, situations and things that uh, change in the environment. We want to stem the decline of already imperiled species, guide restoration of habitats while benefiting other species. We don't want to uh, uh, conflict with management for other taxa and other species with what's contained in the HMG. 
and also reducing the likelihood that additional species will be added to the endangered species list at both state, federal, or other levels. The southwestern United States shares conservation challenges with a lot of other places in the world and certainly in the United States. This is a long list. Uh, we worked hard to compile um, borrowing from the other HMGs. And those that are highlighted are those that have, uh, uh, I would say, extra or specific application to the Southwest. Um, it's some of the last areas to be developed in the United States in the Southwest. And so habitat conversion is a big one, as well as uh, surface and groundwater use. It's a generally arid region. The Southwestern United States is a water starved environment, if you will dependent on rainfall and uh, with fierce battles on water allocation. And so that translates very much to impacts to amphibians and reptiles um, in some situations. Livestock grazing, grazing is, um, is emblematic in the Southwest. You know, the cowboy and uh, the rancher with their livestock um, from cartoons as kids to the very modern world uh, is an important industry. And, so that needs to be balanced, as well as mining oil and gas. Border security has gotten a lot of headlines recently, and we share a border with Mexico, our partner nation to the south, uh, where border security is an issue. And non-native and invasive species, disease, climate change, and energy development. As Larry mentioned in that slide, where large-scale industrial alternative energy uses are um, taking up vast amounts of acreage in what would others might term, you know, uh, desert wasteland. Next slide. There were a number of habitats, we've said it a few times now, in the Southwest, and uh, those in bold, we have some examples here in this webinar, but all of those listed are included in the HMG. Uh, I will say it again that we wrestled a long time to come up with a list of habitats because there are so many in the southwest to keep it lean enough but also inclusive of all the diversity of habitats and so we hope that we've captured that for you uh, and for the end user um, desert scrublands grasslands coastal sage scrub chaparral thorn scrub juniper and pinion juniper we have some examples and then all those in red are can kind of be lumped on the right under one term is uh, freshwater related habitats. <laughs> Next slide. One of the first habitat examples here, or the first, is desert scrublands. And we included this because uh, the Southwest is, as I mentioned, the, the rancher and their cattle. Uh, likewise, open desert is is sort of emblematic of the Southwestern United States. And so it is endemic. To the southwestern U.S., uh, there are four different deserts in North America, all of which occur in the United States in the Southwest. They have vast land areas, are biologically diverse, um, despite their harsh uh, climate and the, the habitat. I heard it said that everything sticks, stings, or stinks in the deserts of the southwest where uh, it is a fairly harsh environment in that sense but it's very sensitive to perturbation or disturbance and so there are also numerous threats with expanding population centers like um, las vegas and los angeles and uh, these vast areas in phoenix that take up a lot of desert area and there are a lot of humans there so there are a lot of threats that need to be balanced with land use uh, as far as priority species, there are a few amphibians and 12 reptiles that we would call it priority species after going through the exercise of defining them within park. And there are a number of conservation challenges as well. I mentioned water and development and alternative energy already and habitat conversion. Next slide, Ken. Uh, thanks, Rob. And our next habitat are grasslands. And they're found in the, uh, the southwestern United States, uh, southwest uh, park region, but of course they're not uh, exclusively found in this region. And the term grassland is really, really sort of a catch-all term for a range of habitats that feature grasses 
as the dominant vegetation type. But even though they look the same, they're climatically, structurally, and comp uh, compositionally very diverse. And uh, I like to think of grasslands as sort of being a matrix habitat, because if you have these large grasslands, you can have other habitats sort of embedded or found within the grasslands, like permanent and ephemeral ponds, springs, sleep, uh, um, seeps, woodlands, can, also, can all be found within this matrix of grasslands. And uh, they're uh, very sensitive, um, especially to fire and uh, poor management, which can cause uh, habitat conversion, allow the uh, influx of invasive species. Uh, grazing can uh, greatly reduce uh, diversity, both of the grasses and uh, of the herbs found within. And agriculture are uh, is uh, impinging upon grasslands and uh, pushing out uh, the, the remaining native grasslands that are found in the southwest region. And as uh, Park has identified, five amphibian and seven reptile priority species for grasslands. Uh, next slide, please. And our next habitat is one that's near and dear to Rob and mine's heart. And uh, these, these are uh, coastal sate scrub and chaparral habitats. And these are very endemic to the Southwest. Uh, found uh, coastal sage scrub is uh, found um, exclusively, in, exclusively in California in the Mediterranean biome. And um, uh, chaparral is found, of course, in California and in Arizona and also spreads a little bit into uh, uh, western um, uh, New Mexico, and they are shrub dominated habitats, and they require periodic fire, fires to keep the habitat healthy, usually a fire return interval of anywhere between 30 to 150 years, 30 years for coastal sage scrub, 150 years or less for chaparral. Um, and uh, these habitats are very endangered, especially coastal sage scrub. Um, they're di disappearing due to development and due to fire. Um, development, of course, removes the habitats completely. Fire destroys them, and due to um, uh, atmos uh, n atmospheric nitrogen in California, it allows native grasses or non native grasses to come in after the fire and totally supplant habitat that was once coastal sage scrub. And uh, management challenges include uh, water loss, drought. Um, the development, fire, habitat conversion, and the influx of invasive species. Uh, next slide. I think this is Larry. Yes, mine. So uh, this one's a little different. This habitat example is juniper and pinion juniper. Uh, these are huge areas, uh, just like the deserts. There's huge areas of juniper and PJ. And uh, one of the, it's actually a native ecosystem, um, but it's often treated as an invasive because what uh, pinion juniper can do is spread into other areas. So it's kind of an ecotonal thing. So for example, it can spread in the grasslands. Grasslands are used for cattle grazing. And so you have an issue there. So it's kind of a balancing act. It's also a different type of example because PJ, and juniper typically has few species of reptiles and amphibians, um, few that are actually characteristic. And as Rob mentioned, park has a mantra, keeping common species common. So this is uh, one of the examples of that. So something like this gopher snake uh, is an animal you might find in here, as well as say fence lizards. Uh, it is a fire adapted ecosystem. Um, there's Often grazing, vegetation restoration, as I said, it's kind of a balance between uh, when it's expanding in the places it doesn't belong versus are we getting rid of it in places where it does belong. Uh, so people need to spend uh, some attention looking at that. And also because of the large acreages it covers, it uh, involves multiple stakeholders. So once you get across, you know, uh, multiple lines of stakeholders have to, everybody's got to work together so that's where partners come in for amphibian reptile conservation. Next. 
Our, our next habitat is uh, actually something that Rob mentioned in an earlier slide, uh, water-related habitats. And again, this is a catch-all category that includes everything, ephemeral pools, permanent ponds, cattle tanks, lakes, streams, rivers, cienegas, et cetera. And just because of the large variety of different types of habitats included within water-related habitats, there are a large number of species included, both uh, common and sensitive. Uh, in the Southwest, of course, water is a limiting resource, resource. And in times of drought, these habitats can shrink. And this uh, is from both uh, natural evaporation and the fact that the habitats aren't being replenished from rain, and also from human use, which can reduce the amount of water available. And the conservation challenges are, are many. Um, development, of course, uh, uh, can cause uh, runoff, pesticides, herbicides, uh, chemicals into um, freshwater habitats and degrade them. Uh, fire management, when fires occur, uh, runoff after the vegetation's been removed can cause uh, siltation and damage um, freshwater habitats. Um, invasive species, bullfrogs, for example, while they're native to the East Coast or the Eastern United States, they are invasives out here. And if they get a toehold, they can wipe out uh, native species found within what um, in in ponds and streams. Uh, next slide. So the last example, this is thorn scrub. And thorn scrub in its pure form is only found in South Texas. And it's a transition from desert to tropical rainforest. So that's kind of what it is. Uh, it, again, it's another habitat uh, endemic to the Southwest. There's also some animals that are um, thorn scrub associates that are found in southern Arizona because thorn scrub is found not too far from the border there. Uh, it's really a small area and it's perhaps the most threatened ecosystem in the United States, well, at least in the Southwest region, I should say, though that's arguable, I guess. It is biologically rich, multiple species. The habitat is sensitive to environmental perturbation and um, for one thing, there's a lot of people that live in South Texas, and so a lot of the habitat is already gone and uh, has been turned into urban areas and all the needs that go along with that. Um, again, we in the Southwest, we have the only border with Mexico, and border security is an, is an issue. And you've been following the news, there's more things going on with that than even when we uh, put these slideshows together. <laughs> So right now there are two species of amphibians and five species of reptiles. And it probably would have been higher, except we thought most of the species are probably okay because there are enough land set aside for them to persist. Uh, but one thing about the priority species list is it needs to be updated periodically. And so as things change, uh, animals can be put on or taken off the list. And just a little, Side note, this is not to replace the Endangered Species Act or anything like that. That's, these are just animals that within our region, we believe, are potentially threatened uh, and need, in need of conservation. Next. Thanks, Larry. So we wanted to showcase a couple examples or highlight a few examples of um, uh, cases where we've been able to bring together partnerships and park large is, that's the first word in uh, the organization is partners and so um, here we wanted to provide some examples of how we were able to partner in an HMG type fashion one of those is the flat-tailed horn lizard uh, for those who aren't aware Death Valley is not the only place that's below sea level in California this horn lizard occupies um, Southern California's Colorado desert region in the Sonoran Desert, either at or below sea level in the Imperial and Coachella Valleys, and then uh, going southward into northern Sonora, Mexico, in Baja and Sonora. And um, 20 years ago, a lot of folks, government agency folks, got together to try and put together something real 
meaning something that we're going to do on the ground for the species to keep it in perpetuity. And again, this year we've celebrated 20 years of voluntary conservation for the flat-tailed horn lizard. Next slide. So how do you go about that? First, you got to figure out your partners, right? And um, they can all come on board later, whatever. But uh, these state and federal partners in Southern California, Arizona, and in Northern Mexico, by national, mind you, um, got together 20 years ago because they saw that there was a problem with this species. And if they didn't put in some protections and monitor the species, it could get listed as endangered for very good reason. The numbers could decline. And that could also jam up their land use from things as diverse as uh, the Marine Corps and Navy doing testing and training to Ocotillo Wells uh, recreational vehicle area, being able to allow people to recreate in California and the Brago Desert State Park to allow people to recreate in the state park through a reclamation with their water management. Um, all these diverse groups got together 20 years ago and formed a coalition for the flat-tailed horn lizard. Um, they are called the flat tail horn lizard ICC, Interagency Coordinating Committee. And the idea, again, is to protect the species in perpetuity, allowing for their land use by managing for that species. Next slide. So one of the first steps, and these steps can be juggled uh, with your specific circumstances, but first you want to define what's important to the species. And this is a fairly busy slide, but if you home in on the, the really dense areas with the most dots, that is uh, densely uh, uh, or darkened areas, those are about the only undeveloped areas in the United States there uh, uh, pictured. And so those areas were carved out and defined by stakeholder. And you can see the blue and red dots kind of at the top left, bordered by the blue is the Salton Sea. And there's agriculture and development in the form of uh, cities and neighborhoods in between these uh, dark shaded blobs within the larger shaded area that is the range of the species. So these stakeholders define those management areas that are important to the species in perpetuity. If you want to grab what's left and what's available for the species, those are those areas. Next slide. So defining where the species is on your land or lands Here's a, a cleaner figure showing those shaded areas that I was indicating. And then they, um, the acronyms are um, for the different management and research areas uh, divvied up by landowner and stakeholder. Next slide. So now that you have those areas, you kind of have your, your head around where the species is on your land area or shared among land areas, you need to develop a management strategy. How do we manage this species? How do we watch it and, and take care of it in perpetuity and monitor it uh, and not just monitor it to a decline, to an extinction, which has happened for many species. And there's papers written about that. So developing a management strategy with real on the ground uh, uh, um, strategies how to count it, how to watch it, how to uh, reduce impacts to its habitat, to the species directly is really important. So there were two additions. This one pictured is the cover of the 2003 revision, which is the one we're using today. Next slide. There are 11 different federal and state uh, uh, offices involved among those multiple stakeholders I mentioned. Uh, and so the third step is to implement the management strategy. Take what you've written in that document that you've deemed as important to the species and put it on the ground. Analyze your data, maintain your data, make sure that you're getting quality results, that you're um, responsible and that people are truly doing what their, uh, uh, the landowners are, are called to do within the, the terms of the management strategy. And this uh, graph just shows some of the trends in time for a particular management area from 2012, the detection probabilities, um, there are multiple land uses. The picture of the gentleman there, that's Rob Palmer, where we were blading a road to go out and do geothermal uh, exploration on Navy land. And so that's a linear impact and you need to mitigate that and understand that that could have um, some undue consequences for the flat-tailed horn lizard. 
And likewise, there's natural predation in the bottom right where sidewinders and other species will uh, predate the species. So you need to consider the predation, mitigate the threats, and definitely monitor the species because without good data, you're not going to be able to form good management decisions. Next slide. And the most important thing, I started off with partnerships, is to maintain those partnerships with all your stakeholders. And so last year we had our first symposium after 20 years that was exclusive to the flat-tailed horn lizard. And it was a really diverse set of folks, but that uh, right there in that picture, that is 20 years of success. Those are the people who have kept their hand on the rudder for that species and are continuing to manage it through time with turnover in staffing and funding with all the problems, but as a partnership, you're able to weather those uh, uh, problems and changes better than by doing it solo. And so after 20 years, we've been through the federal courts a few times with this species to petition to list it, and it was never listed because we are truly managing it, and we have good numbers and good data to indicate that. Next slide. So now we're going to um, flip-flop to a wetter area with wet herps. So this is the Chiricahua leopard frog. <clears throat> this is another example of using partnerships to try and recover species that are uh, in not good shape. My example here is focusing mostly on southeastern Arizona in this mountain range, a small mountain range called the Pajarito Mountains. Next slide. So the problem is, as with the uh, horn lizard, its populations are being extirpated and the species as a whole is headed towards extinction. And this is a uh, federally threatened species. The problem is that um, it's succumbing to a number of factors such as chytridiomycosis, which is a deadly uh, fungal infection that affects amphibians, especially frogs. Um, just a general lack of surface water because water is being diverted. And then there's drought, climate change, and then invasive uh, species, most notably the American bullfrog. Can't mention that. If you're in East Texas, it's native there, but out farther west, it causes big problems. <clears throat> and there, of course, there are many partners, as Rob alluded to, on any of these projects, and that's why we're partners in conservation. Um, and so you can see the list there. Next slide, please. Okay, this, my little story here begins with the University of Arizona and Arizona Game and Fish Department. And they took on what seemed to be an immense task that probably a lot of people think, well, you can't even do that. What that is, is you'll never have recovery of a Chiricahua leopard frog population if you have bullfrogs present. And so, again, focusing on the Pajarito Mountains, uh, these two groups went in, and actually at the University of Arizona, there was uh, some graduate students who were really involved in this. And then Arizona Game and Fish, they have a, a department on frogs, actually, because it's, we're losing a lot of native species. So. They had to first get rid of um, the bullfrogs before we could get the Chiricahua leopard frogs back. And so nobody likes killing stuff. And, you know, these bullfrogs can't help that they were, you know, living here. And, uh, and it's not their fault. But we had to get rid of them. And so um, the frogs were killed. But the good news is that they were actually taken to the Phoenix Zoo where they're fed to crocodilians. And so they kind of helped help those animals out. And so they did, um, what was to some the unmanageable, they actually got rid of uh, dozens of populations of American bullfrogs. And they actually eradicated them from this whole area, <laughs> except that to the uh, east, there is a river system that it's hard for them to, they can always hide out in there. Next, please. Um, at the time, I was working for the Coronado National Forest, and just here's just some of the things that we did as our little part to help. For example, I was on the uh, leopard frog recovery team, 
and uh, you can see there's various various things that we did. I won't go through the whole list, but it's um, it's one of these things where you think globally, act locally, and so everything we do to help bring this animal, this species back, is useful. Uh, next slide. And something I think we're really kind of proud of <laughs> was this Rudy Ronquillo pond. And Peña Blanca Spring is really just a, it was a broken spring box and it fed to a cattle drinker. And there'd always be one or two leopard frogs there, sometimes lowland, sometimes Chiricahua leopard frogs. But as the bullfrog eradication was getting underway and Peña Blanca Lake was being eradicated of bullfrogs because it was a super site, we took advantage to improve habitat at this spring. And so they built, uh, rebuilt a pond and had a wetland that creeped out of there. And now if you go to this site, there are dozens or maybe hundreds of Chiricahua leopard frogs every time. So it's a huge success story. And there are also a number of other species of amphibians and countless species of butterflies. It's just incredible what this place has become. And so this is just a little a little pond with bentonite uh, that was put in, but it made a huge difference. And it's now supplying a source of Chiricahua leopard frogs to go elsewhere in the pond regions. Next slide, please. And so again, that was just one piece of the the conservation efforts for the Chiricahua leopard frog. I mean, you think about all the agencies that did their parts and the Forest Service that did their parts on different plots of land and how people have actually worked uh, towards other species and similar habitats, such as lowland leopard frogs, Tara humara frogs, which incidentally were uh, the, the first frog that went extinct in the United States and are trying to bring it back. There are also native tiger salamanders um, and narrow-headed garter snakes and Mexican garter snakes. So all of the efforts to help all of these aquatic animals from this, this general area of southern Arizona just means more success across the board. Next slide. Okay. Um, suppose you want to uh, implement uh, uh, or cons conserve reptiles and amphibians. What do you do? How do you get started? Well, uh, suppose you want to, for example, uh, mitigate for a solar farm or improve habitat for a particular species. In this case, we have here the uh, endangered, formerly endangered American alligator. Next slide. Well, the first thing you want to do is get a hold of one of the HMGs for your particular region. And within each M HMG, uh, there are two sets of recommendation for each habitat within the particular document. And depending on what your goals are, you may uh, choose the ideal set of recommendations. And, and those uh, are for land managers who uh, are, are focusing specifically on amphibian reptiles as the uh, amphibian reptile conservation is their primary goal. So uh, referring to the uh, previous slide, this would be the uh, example using the alligator. Compatible uh, recommendations are for land managers who wish to contribute to the conservation of amphibians and reptiles while managing for multiple uses. So that would be the example using the solar uh, farm. Next slide, please. So if you read the HMG for, all the, for your region and identify the specific habitats that are within your sphere of influence, so forest, uh, forest, grassland, ecotone, grassland, and then wetland. And then identify the specific conservation challenges that are represented within these habitats. Timber harvest, roads, uh, grazing, and invasive grasses. Next slide, please. Then go to uh, Appendix B in the Southwest HMG. And there are guidelines in there for developing a uh, specific management plan. And in the next couple of slides, we're going to go over some of the higher points within uh, that uh, Appendix B. Next slide. 
So what's really important before you get started is to familiarize yourself with federal, state, and local regulations and policies regarding herps and their habitats, what permits are required, what you can and can't do in specific habitats. And of course, uh, uh, PARC has put out a, a document that uh, has the uh, an overview of the legal um, recommend legal documents for each state in the union. Next slide, please. So what's really important is that before you begin any uh, management plan is know what you have. And this is uh, identifying potential amphibian reptile habitats, identifying the location of the habitats using spatial information, uh, VegMap GIS to drop a VegMap and identify the exact locations. Identify the species or uh, that are known or suspected to occur in each habitat type and identify the management objectives for each habitat. Now you can do this uh, on paper or do it on the ground. Of course, doing it on the ground is a lot more fun. Uh, and I guess that would depend upon what budgetary constraints you also have. So it's very important to inventory what you've got before you move forward. Next slide, please. And when implementing a management plan, consider uh, possibly addressing multiple species, consider various mitigation options for any impacts that may be incurred, uh, consider direct and indirect effects that your management uh, uh, efforts may have on other species. And it's really important to stay the course because uh, the results from any management uh, plan may not bear fruit for a year, maybe two years out. Next slide, please. And of course, uh, no management plan is perfect from the get-go. And uh, it's really important to monitor the uh, um, uh, aspects of the management plan as you move forward and uh, evaluate different parts of it. And if things aren't working out the way they should, uh, simply mod modify the plan and change it so that it continues to move forward and hopefully meet specific management goals that you have. Uh, next slide. Ken, I just wanted to mention that with adaptive management, please consider that even within the HMGs, this journey started about 10 years ago to develop the Southwest HMG, and the other HMGs were being produced at that time and, uh, and or had been. And so to note, at least one of those HMGs has been revised during the period that PARC has been putting them together because conditions change. And so with adaptive management, expect change as the norm and plan for the future. And also the resources at the end of the HMG, we tried to make as, uh, as develop them as, as much as we could for the end user so that you've got a wealth of information to refer to. And if not, then there, reach out to your local university, natural history museum, or uh, uh, other biological collaborators and other agencies, and I'm sure they would be happy to help you. Next slide. Okay, we'll open it up um, for questions at this time. I don't see any typed in the questions box, but I actually um, I have one for Larry. Um, when Larry was talking about the bullfrog example where they had to eradicate them for the Chiricahua leopard frogs, um, there's a lot of, I know, national park units that are dealing with bullfrog eradication and management. And so I was wondering, Larry, if you had any specific recommendations as to what you found to be most effective for managing bullfrogs? Um, I would say they, the people that did this, it was not me really, <laughs> but uh, a lot of the partners that did this kind of came from all different angles. They did whatever it took for a specific situation. Um, so for example, in Sycamore Creek, which was uh, a natural ecosystem in which three species of native branded frogs had essentially gone extinct, uh, it was overrun with bullfrogs and they used uh, large nets uh, like they use for commercial fishing and actually went into some of the pools and got rid of as many as they possibly could. And then they had to do other things. So the bullfrogs are primarily nocturnal. 
And so uh, they needed to go back to sites and they, they were permitted and the like to uh, use guns. Um, and then they would also dig the frogs. And it was particularly important for them to identify adult breeders. So none of them were allowed to be there, but an adult breeder was really bad news <laughs> because of the progeny it could, it could do. And then another thing that's been done is, um, for example, electrofishing in uh, some standing water areas. And so some of these areas that are really complex, um, it takes a lot of effort. That's only, that's part one. Part two is that you need to uh, maintain the situation. So in this area, the Chiricahua leopard frog and lowland leopard frogs both occur there. Populations exploded and they were like, almost, you know, few and far between, and then they're like all over again, so it's great. But that will reverse itself if they're allowed to uh, go back to the way it was. So that source pool I mentioned that was along the, uh, the river uh, has to be watched. And so these agencies uh, need to go out every year and make sure no breeding adults are getting into the population. So it's just kind of a, whatever works for that situation, I guess is the answer. Okay, thanks, Larry. Great answer. Um, and so we also had a question. I'll, I'll give this one to Rob. Um, how do folks get the habitat management guidelines? Yeah, so uh, they're still available for purchase. Help me out on that, Jen. Uh, online at the Park Place website that Jen mentioned at the beginning. Um, Park usually sets up a booth at the major HERT meetings within uh, different regions, and I expect there will be some available there. And also, it will be available as a PDF eventually. Don't mean to wah, wah, wah on park for the profits, but uh, uh, we need to sell out the remaining hard copies. And then I think, uh, like some of the other HMGs, it will be available as a PDF at the parkplace.org website. Sorry, sure. I don't have a bunch of copies extra, to, so don't email me and ask. <laughs> 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 um, and they're also available online at Amazon.com. If you just type in the name of the um, publication, it's um, I believe it's $15 plus shipping and handling. But um, that question actually came from somebody within the National Park Service. So if you work for the National Park Service, please email me um, because the Park Service bought a supply for Park Service employees. And so I have some here in my office that I can mail to you, mail you a hard copy. Um, yeah, Jen, I'll, I'll, I'll also, uh, uh, real quick, I'll add that DOD had also bought some copies, but we exhausted those. So if you're with DOD, um, sorry, we've already given those all out, like the Park Service. A lot of agencies contributed, but like Larry mentioned, for Forest Service, so uh, props to everyone who did. Okay, and somebody had commented in the questions box that it's already available um, through PDF, and that's actually not the case. Um, you know, we're maintaining the copy of the PDF until, again, as Rob had mentioned, that we're, um, you know, we've kind of exhausted sales and aren't aren't getting any, you know, after a considerable amount of time. Okay, so this question is for the group. What can early career herpetologists, such as those who are in graduate school, who are interested in academic um, careers, do to help mm -hmm. managers with our research? Any general advice? Wow. Yeah, that, there's a lot of they things said, that you um, can do. And They said another way of putting this is how can an academic research best inform management? I would always encourage students to make sure they get their results published. That way it gets out there into the peer-reviewed literature so that herpetologists can find it. Uh, but Ken, you're, you're a reserve manager. Larry and, and I both have experience, but you're, you're um, experience would be really vital to this. How do you get that intel? Well, um, we don't really have, I can't really give a perspective uh, from herps, but uh, for uh, small mammals, uh, we interact regularly with the agency people, uh, Forest Service, uh, Cal Fish and Game, Fish and Wildlife Service, and university people that do research. So there's an exchange at these meetings. So I guess one way to uh, interact with management people would be to um, approach 
um, people that are in the agencies that may be doing um, uh, that may be managing for a particular species and if you are um, studying that particular species or uh, multiple species uh, speak with them because you may have information that would be vital to their management because that's one of the main problems is that there's not really a lot of cross-pollination between um, the agencies and academia unless the agencies actually fund an academic research. Otherwise, if you have particular information that was funded by NSF, that would be um, applicable to a management situation. It may never make it into the management arena. So um, I think it would be uh, behoove you to be proactive in that regard. I would and like we to were add one students too. That. Sorry, Larry, <laughs> just to add real quick, we were one students okay. too. Don't be bashful about talking to us because when you've got good data on a species, reach out to those folks that have that species on their land. Larry, sorry. Uh, that's okay. I was just going to point out and kind of an aside to this question, um, but academia is not the only outlet for research. Um, yep. Because uh, the three of us are actually, well, Rob and I are both public land management agency people. I came from the research branch of the Forest Service. And uh, the thing about when you go to these park meetings, you'll see a little bit of everybody. So you have some of the academia, uh, some people do research, some don't, some do management. And Ken mentioned it's, it's good to cross pollinate and sometimes that's difficult. But I would say by attending a park meeting, especially a Southwest park meeting, you're there to cross pollinate. You're there to network with everyone else from all these different groups. Okay, so we have some more comments and questions rolling in. Um, I think that this comment is, is helping to answer the question about how academia can um, work with management. But one of the webinar participants said that the Forest Service could always use inventory and surveys along with population estimates. So maybe contact your local Forest Service office um, another question that came in, and we, and we have several to get through, it says, if you cannot remove all bullfrogs from a possible leopard frog site, is it still useful to try to remove just breeding adults? That question is probably for Larry. Well, I'm more of a reptile guy, but <laughs> I'll try and bend this. Um, I would say yes. I would say yes, it's worth to try to manage it as best you can. There's a couple of reasons I say that is I think all the efforts help, number one. But I also think that the chytridiomycosis, um, the animals may hopefully become adapted to this over time. So this is a, a new disease that was thrust upon these animals that had no resistance to it whatsoever. And so if you can keep the bullfrogs down, and I forgot to mention that Bullfrogs can be a source of chytridiomycosis. They have it, they can have it, but they don't actually uh, catch it themselves and die of it, uh, like most of the native random frogs do. So I think it's always worth uh, that extra effort just in case the, the population can adapt. There are also some areas where you can have, some areas where you can have bullfrogs as well as native random frogs coexisting. And those types of places are usually complex habitats. So uh, I mentioned there's like rivers with oxbows and wetlands. So there's like shallow areas or maybe deep pools. So you might have bullfrogs in the pools and in the overflow of the oxbows and the wetlands, you might have the leopard frogs holding on. So I guess I'm one to think that whatever you can do helps and doesn't hurt. And then when you're doing that, you should also be documenting what's happening. And so we can learn from it. And even if it's, uh, it's nothing done under scientific rigor, at least you can share information with others about what seems to be happening. But that's kind of the same basis for adaptive management. See what works and see what doesn't. Hey, Larry, for a non-reptile guy, didn't you write Amphibians of the Pacific Northwest, the book? Yeah, but that was up there. There's all wet hoops <laughs> up there down here. I'm in the land of dry hoops now. <laughs> 
Um, right on. Okay, so we have another question here. It says, what are the most important management principles to consider when trying to conserve habitat for endemic plethodonids? And the example they gave was like the Jemez Mountain Salamander. Can anybody take that one? Just add water. Okay, could you repeat the question? Sure. I'll try to send it. What are the most important management principles to consider when trying to conserve habitat for endemic plethodonids? Okay, so I actually worked on plethodonids <laughs> um, in the Pacific Northwest, so that was a little different. That's in an area where it's perpetually wet. And so plethodonid salamanders, they're, they are amphibians, um, but they get their, their moisture through the environment, which usually means uh, moist to wet substrate. And so when it comes down to survivability of plethodonid salamanders, especially these, you know, these truly terrestrial ones like we have in the West, um, then it's all about conserving the moisture in the microhabitats. And so for example, some concepts here are, if you had to say thin an area, uh, say thin a forest around where there's a population of plethodonid um, salamanders, the closer you get to the salamander, the more surface the area have of xerification where it dries out and you're thereby affecting the, the animal. So if you want to maintain a population of something that has uh, such strict water needs, you'd probably want to have a much larger buffer. Uh, so you need to do that. And then also the other thing about plethodon and salamanders, and some are rock dwellers, some are wood dwellers, but what they normally like is complex uh, structural features, such as big logs and then uh, deep talus slopes, things like that. So I, I think it all comes down to microhabitat, but you need to maintain the, uh, the character of the microhabitat. Hey Larry, I'd I'd also add, um, don't. I want this. I'm kind of tiptoeing on the wire here. Uh, don't be naive that a lot of the the springs and seeps that have plethodonids uh, in the arid southwest, you're looking at multi-species management where they could be guzzlers um, or places that are used as you know natural springs and seeps where horses and burros and bighorn sheep and deer are also using that habitat and there could very well be a management action in place for other species like larger hoof mammals um, so there are numerous examples where sites have been compromised by the same right and so make sure that so you that, integrate that, with your, your yeah that does bring up the point that a plethodon salamander is not a plethodon and salamander is a plethodon and salamander because there are some that live in seeps and some that are completely terrestrial. And so when I heard the uh, reference to New Mexico, I was thinking of the, those are basically forest dwellers that are completely upland um, that are found in an arid area, which is very different than East Texas, which is very different than the Northwest. So again, it's knowing the animal's life history. And uh, as, as Rob was saying, these other animals that may, you know, be there as well. There's a lot to juggle, I admit. There's a lot to juggle, and you just do the best you can. Okay, thank you. Um, and I will contact the person who asked this question um, after the webinar, but I thought maybe off the top of your head, you guys might know some other individuals as well, but they want to know if there are any contacts or agencies in Colorado who are actively controlling bullfrogs. I know some folks in Colorado Park that um, I can get this person connected up with, but do you guys know of anybody off the top of your head? This Colorado Park, mm. they, you know, that was one of the pins on the map where there's a state uh, chapter of park is Colorado. Um, and so Jen, if you don't mind, if you're going to follow up with them, shoot them, maybe their current chairperson or whatever. Okay, sounds good. Um, then the next question is, are feral and domestic cats a problem anywhere within the Southwest? If so, how are they being dealt with given the strong advocacy for them? That's a tough question. 
Mm-hmm. Yeah, I don't, I, I don't want to dominate the questions, but I will say uh, coastal California. Since I work for the military, uh, in my paying job, there are a number of um, Navy installations that have that issue. And uh, just as the question was posed, there's a lot of love out there for cats, independent of what they may be doing to threaten or endangered species directly. And only through um, involving everyone and getting to a, a spay, neuter, release, or capture and remove effort. Um, it takes a consortium of people and a lot of effort. Um, besides the signage, the enforcement, maybe if people are dumping food and things like that, that you have existing uh, regulations to control, you need to work it in a really diverse way to start to get those numbers down. The Channel Islands, California, it's probably the best example where oh, yeah. that land went to National Park Service and or military where they got them out of there. They were not compatible with the land use, um, but that took decades and those cats are not easy to remove. But yeah, the main problem with uh, oh, the main problem with cats that that uh, I'm familiar with is in urban areas and not so much with herps, but they take out a lot of songbirds. And once you get away from the urban areas, you know, more coyotes because they keep tabs on the cats, you know, sort of a biological might, control for cats. Yeah. I might point out that in the HMG is Appendix C, which is non native invasive species of concern for amphibians and reptiles. It doesn't answer the question. Uh, around Tucson here, cats last about 20 minutes before they're eaten by coyotes. So it's not an issue here, but. Right, the Channel Islands yep. is a really good example. And there are all kinds of things, like feral hogs in Texas, for example, and parts of California there. Yeah, it's something to be reckoned with. Yeah. Out, outside of wet places, you know, like I said, coastal California, like Larry said, <laughs> put them near coyotes and they don't last long at all. <laughs> I don't mean to laugh, but uh, yeah, it's just a natural cycle. Okay, um, and I think that this might be the last question, unless another one pops in after, while I'm reading this, but do you have specific guidance for northern leopard frog conservation and recovery, specifically for the front range of Colorado? So again, that's specific guidance for northern leopard frog conservation and recovery. Well, I'll, I'll well, take I'll... the first part of this. Number one, contact Colorado Park, as previously mentioned, but I think there are many, many resources on leopard frog management. And uh, there's the leopard frog recovery plan. And uh, there's many agencies that are involved. So, it, you know, in, in two minutes, I can't say specifically what to do. But I would say there's there's a wealth of information out there that's useful and can be um, uh, put to good use. And there are many people who uh, can be contacted, who have expertise in that field. So I think this is like the desert tortoises, where a lot of money has been spent trying to manage for those things. And so there are a lot of resources available from the research and the previous management um, plans that have been uh, used. And this is kind of a shout out, but email Aaron Moose. E R I N dot M U T H S at USGS dot, dot gov. And uh, she's been working with toads predominantly in the front range there for a long time. And Erin's a great gal and a good supporter of uh, Southwest Park, but she falls right in there. Jen's right there in your backyard. Um, so there's a lot of really good allies for that question in, in Colorado in general, besides just hitting up the uh, Colorado Park branch of park, if you will, state chapter. Okay. And we have um, another question that came in. What do you feel is the best way to balance the desire to increase community support and involvement for herp conservation and the threat of poaching? So again, how do you get community support and involvement for herp conservation, but then balance that with, you know, people then going out there and illegally collecting? Hmm. Wow. Okay, I'll take a you know, stab I, at this. I'll go ahead. <laughs> I, w- I was just going to say, uh, I, I always think about things that um, 
Uh, again, I don't want this to come across the wrong way, but if we know better, then it's our job to teach others, or if we know of a better alternative. And so you really have to become engaged and be proactive on things. If you're concerned that people are doing bad things in the form of poaching or getting them energized with herbs, it's a matter of teaching. There's, there's kind of a, uh, a mantle of responsibility there to get the word out and show people why we like herbs and the cool things that they may not understand about herbs. But you, you can't diss on other people for not doing it. It's a matter of educating them and bringing them up. And that's the big uh, emphasis of PARC at large um, is to get partnerships where people are energized and educated about the benefits of herbs. Can I give you a couple good examples? One, I'm working with the Tucson Herpological Society, and this is not a group, um, you know, they like, they like to hold giant snakes and show what different color morphs they have. This is a group that's conservation-oriented, education-oriented, and we're um, doing a lot of outreach and coming up uh, with ideas how to reach out to the public. And in fact, we already do some of that, but uh, we're looking to do even more of that um, over time. And I was also thinking too, that maybe you could use um, common species or things like that, you know, like not take the public to um, locations of rare species or, or anything like that. But even with common species, you have that thread of somebody going in and collecting, you know, hundreds of, a common species frog, I guess, after you would show them a site. But um, again, I guess it goes back to what Rob said about being the, the one who teaches them better. And with that, I guess right. we don't you have know, any more. Oh, go ahead, sorry. Okay, I just want to add one thing. Uh, another thing in the HMG is we talk about success stories and some of these sidebars. And one of the success stories is about these rattlesnake roundups. Um, and so, I mean, I live in Arizona where poaching is a big deal, but there's also a lot of people who are not really into the, the whole uh, collect and, and kill thing. We don't have legal um, collection here. But in Texas, uh, we talk about one of the rattlesnake roundups that became a nature festival. And so no animals are killed at all. In fact, where they used to cut the heads off and stand amongst a, a bunch of snakes and people invariably get snake bitten. That's completely gone, and what it is, it's an education thing, and it's just as popular as ever. Okay. Well, we don't have any more questions. I'd like to thank everybody for joining us today, and especially Larry, Ken, and Rob for taking the time to share their expertise on amphibian and reptile conservation and management. And with that, um, we will end the webinar. And again, this will be available as a recording um, if you want to go back to it later on parkplace.org. Thanks, everybody. Thanks, y'all. Thanks, Jen.